starting from where I know of it now, Reiki is actually a practice derived from the combination of esoteric Buddhism and Confucianism and Shigundo and Shintoism. Uh, Master Asui, the man who created this system of healing, was uh, a practicing Buddhist. So a lot of the practice of Reiki is very similar to the mindfulness practices of Buddhism. And ultimately, it's a personal practice for self-development and spiritual transformation. We're reaching for the gift of something called Satori or enlightenment. And you get there by connecting to the energy of the earth and the energy of the heavens and becoming those energies and becoming the energy of oneness. And as you do that, as you become the energy of oneness, then your energy becomes in alignment and clear and safe and stable and balanced. Welcome to the In Vibe Live podcast with Amy Parker and Cheryl Dunn. By tuning in, you are joining a community that will inspire you to increase balance, wellness, and joy in your life. We'll offer expert information and insightful conversations to help us all on our journey to live more in vibe. For more information and articles, remember to also check out our website at invibelife.com. That's E-N-V-I-B-E-L-I-F-E.com. And we're grateful that you're here. Hi, and welcome to the In Vibe Life podcast. You are here today with Amy and Cheryl and our special guest, Izzy Swanson. And Cheryl and I have been talking for a while about wanting to begin to introduce our audience, all of you out there, to different forms of healing, maybe different things we have an interest in or we've heard from others they do. Some of these things maybe we know a lot about, some of them maybe we know very little about, and here we go. This is our first um, day of this with Izzy. Izzy is a master Reiki trainer and practitioner and is going to share information with us today about what Reiki is. So Izzy, I think we'll just let you start. Tell us about yourself, your background, how you um, found yourself now being a healer in this modality. And then, you know, we can get into what Reiki is. Um, Awesome. Thank you, uh, both Amy and Cheryl, for having me. Uh, Starting with how I got here, that's a pretty long story, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I have a a, a history of trauma and some other things, and I actually was diagnosed with Hashimoto's about 10 years ago, and at the point that I was diagnosed, I was having one of those experiences where doctors weren't listening to me. Nobody was diagnosing me and I was dying and no doctor would pay attention to me because I was too young to be experiencing those symptoms. So I kind of took matters into my own hands and I started looking for uh, other methods of healing like acupuncture and meditation and um, other spiritual practices. And through that um, was connected with somebody who Um, volunteered to teach me and a few of my friends Reiki. It was really interesting because uh, I didn't set out to learn Reiki. It was kind of accidental and I kind of stumbled into it. Um, But then I I was like, sure, why not? I wanted to stay with my friends. I did it to stay with my friends and then ended up having this majorly transformational upheaval type healing process. And, you know, before I started the process, I was dying. And by the end of my training, I was a whole different person, like physically, even uh, when I say physically, I mean, even my face shape, like you can look at pictures of me before I was uh, tuned to Reiki. And before I went through this healing crisis, and my face is different, like my hair is different, everything like the structure, like the texture of my hair, like it all changed, my whole body changed. Um, Amazing. I'm just going to like jump in to say for those of you um, who are not listening or are listening only and not seeing the audio, which there is an audio version of this podcast too, you would be shocked at what you're hearing right now because Izzy looks the picture of health. Yeah. You know, I, I would never guess that that was in your history or background. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Yeah, I have had a near death experience. It's kind of how I got here. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember everything else that you said, but that's kind of how I got to this place. It's how I got to into the practice of Reiki. And 
the other part of that is after that experience, I realized I didn't want to be doing what I was doing with my life anymore. I was a biologist working for the state's environmental agency, and it was not what I wanted. And I knew that I wanted to show other people that these kinds of transformations are possible. And I wanted to move into a field where I could be of service in a different way. And that's, I kind of, I literally jumped off the deep end and here I am. <laughs> I love that. Sometimes uh, Amy and I have even done a podcast on that, that it takes sometimes the deep ends for us to make massive changes. And, and I think even one time, Amy, we said something like, um, it's the cracks that the lights come into. Right. Right. Uh, in the darkness, you recognize the light. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more. I know that's how you kind of got into Reiki, but what was your first reaction to it? Like when somebody said, we're going to do Reiki, did you have any clue what that was? No, not the first time. No, I, I was, I was just like, Hey, I've heard about this. I, I already knew how to meditate. I already had a meditation practice. So I thought it'd be something like that. And it is kind of something like that. But uh, my first experience was re- with Reiki was the attunement, my first attunement. So um, wow. what yeah. is that? What's an attunement? Well, let's, let's even roll back before that. I mean, this <laughs> you the perfect person to introduce this um, to the audience out there. Because mm-hmm. first of all, I think this is probably how a lot of our audience is. Maybe they're aware of mindfulness practices and some alternative therapies. And, um, you know, you hear the word Reiki more and more all the time, but might not know what it is or if it, who it's right for, or who it's not right for. There might be a little fearfulness about what it is. So I think this is perfect. Why don't you start at like the ground level and what is Reiki? Okay. Um, I guess let me clarify real quick that my interpretation or my perception of what Reiki was or what I didn't know of it is completely different than what I know of it now. Okay. Um, Reiki is starting from where I know of it now. Reiki is actually a practice derived from the combination of esoteric Buddhism and Confucianism and Shikundo and Shintoism. Uh, Master Asui, the man who created this system of healing, was uh, a practicing Buddhist. So a lot of the practice of Reiki is very similar to the mindfulness practices of Buddhism. And ultimately, it's a personal practice for self-development and spiritual transformation. We're reaching for the gift of something called Satori or Enlightenment. And you get there by connecting to the energy of the earth and the energy of the heavens and becoming those energies and becoming the energy of oneness. And as you do that, as you become the energy of oneness, then your energy becomes in alignment and clear and safe and stable and balanced. And because of that, those of us who practice on behalf of other people are able to convey that same energy to others because we become that energy. We help others become that energy. And that's what, that's the practice of Reiki, but that was definitely not what I knew of it in the beginning. Um, Reiki is passed down from teacher to student through a process of attunement. Um, The attunements, depending on different people do it differently. It's done different here in the West than Master Asui did it when he was in Japan. But it's a sort of a ritual process where you use a series of symbols to open up the energy channel of the student or whoever's receiving it and convey to them these energies, the earth energy or focus energy, the heavenly energy or divine energy, the energy of oneness, and then the master energy. And you're you're breathing that there's a series of breathing practices that you use to breathe it into the person who's receiving it. And that's how Reiki is traditionally passed on. Got it. Got it. So once you reach this uh, oneness or enlightenment, do you stay there or can you vacillate in and out of it? Um, I don't tend to think that this idea of becoming oneness, it, with any healing practice, not just Reiki. It's not like we achieve some kind of, I got here, I'm done, I've healed. Right, right. It's, it's a process. It's a practice. 
Uh, Reiki is like a martial art. It's a lifestyle. It's something that you do daily. You have a daily practice. We have specific uh, Hera or Dantian strengthening exercises that we're supposed to practice consistently and a Hatsureho meditation that prepares and cleanses our energy. And then we have principles and pillars, the principles and the pillars of Reiki that we live by as part of our practice. So it's a process. It's something that requires practice and you do all the time. And kind of in my mind, it's, I mean, life is still going to happen. It doesn't matter how enlightened you become. Right. Pandemics are still going to happen. Trauma is still going to happen. Crisis is still going to happen. So instead, what you have is a set of tools that help you come back to balance and centeredness or help you maintain that while you're going through everything that life throws at you. So I don't think it's like this place that you attain. I think right. it's a, a way that you live. Great, great, great. What, what about the person who might want to try it or have heard about it and then heard everything you just said and went, whoa, that's a lot for me to handle. Mm-hmm. Is that what the normal um, client would experience the first time they come in or like, you know, the first time you go into a practitioner for a Reiki session, what would, um, what would I or Cheryl experience if we came in to a session? For example? So I guess I'm getting a little way of like what my life is as a Reiki practitioner. Um, Which I when, I'm doing this, <laughs> when you do this for, when I do this for other folks, um, I don't have to, I don't normally go into all of that unless they want to know. I try to be as transparent as I can about it. So they understand because a lot of folks have no idea Um, what they're doing or what they're getting into. And so they're nervous and they have a lot of questions. Um, But ultimately I just chat with people for a few minutes and kind of figure out what's most important for them right here, right now. So we can set intention, which is part of the practice of Reiki. And then I have them lie down on the table and guide them through some breathing exercises and let them know you may feel like you're floating or spinning. You may feel like you're seeing visions or you may fall asleep, but ultimately it's just a sense of rest and relaxation that they're feeling while they're receiving it, um, while I'm giving it to them or channeling it for them. Does that answer your question? It does. I mean, I, I really even wanted to mystify it more. I know I had one Reiki session that I went into at a spa. It, it was, a uh, you know, one of the spas in Arizona, you go and there's all, all, all sorts of things, everything from massage to all kinds of healing mm-hmm. um, taking place. It's not that much different than getting a massage, really, except it's not the hands on meeting your muscles experience, but you lie on a table, you do breathing. It's just a very peaceful, tranquil experience for the person receiving the treatment mm-hmm. and not scary at all. It, it, yeah, you're right. It's just relaxing and almost like you're falling asleep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not painful. It's not, yeah. not disruptive in any way. So my, uh, first experience of Reiki, I've never signed up for a session and gone in and had it done to me. There was a client of mine who came in and was in my lobby and was telling me about Reiki. And I said, oh, really? And she goes, yeah, I can do it to you. And she took her hand and placed it on top of my head. And I just stood there. Now, mind you, you know, I work movement, body. I'm really in tune with what I'm feeling. And all of a sudden, in places that I experience um, uh, physical discomfort, like knee pain, hip pain, that kind of stuff, all of those places on my body started to tingle. So I wasn't laying on a table. I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't do any of the prep work. I didn't put up any boundaries. I would say I had no um, idea what I I didn't go in with this. I walked into my lobby and was like, Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? And she started talking about Reiki and her, she just came from her training here. Let me do this on you. Put her Mm -hmm. hand here. And bam, I was like, Whoa, my shoulders tingling. My knees tingling. Mm -hmm. my foot's tingling. And it just made me feel like all of a sudden there was a big energy flow Mm -hmm. where possibly energy was stuck and stagnant. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the next thing I wanted to get into a little bit is that um, 
And you also, Izzy, being a scientist, are the perfect person to talk about this. Mm-hmm. That, And I, I think, you know, we've kind of started touching on energy with our audience a little bit, Cheryl, but not gotten too much into it. And I know a little bit about Reiki. I have some training in a slightly different modality, but with some similarities. So I'll try to do the most basic introduction to this and then Izzy let you take over. And so one of the basic concepts, you know, if we think about quantum physics, right, which not, I guess not many of us think about quantum physics. I remember being introduced to it in one of my college science classes. It made absolutely no sense to me, but going back to that or even to high school or middle school science classes where you learn that all matter is made of atoms, which are really energy and moving all the time. Mm -hmm. And we really kind of forget that, that even the solid surfaces around us, of course, the trees, the birds, all living creatures and even non-living creatures are really made of matter. They're really energy at their core. Mm -hmm. And so what Reiki or energy healing practices seek to do is to help heal you from an energetic level. Am I getting that right? Or was that a good introduction to it? Maybe you can take that over a little bit. I want, I want people to understand kind of what the premise or goal or why this can work um, is. And to me, that's it. It, it, even the studying I've done has been so I inform myself on energy Mm -hmm. better. Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing. First of all, you've got a really good grasp on how energy works. So I don't know that I could add much more to that other than everything that has this flow of atoms and molecules moving, it's flowing everywhere. And the movement, uh, like in the connections we make with other people between different things, like it's everywhere all the time. Like we could just imagine putting your hand right here. You're touching that in the air, in everything. So it's all, that's how everything is connected. That's where oneness kind of comes into play because all of that energy is not just moving within like my body or the energy or through the tree, but it's moving around the tree and between me and the tree. And that's an important thing to know, which is hard to define. It sounds very woo woo, but it's actually a real thing that we do have scientists, um, quantum physics and other scientists now um, measuring and being able to define. So we can show you how this works, but how it really works in the body is very simple in that because and your cells are made up of energy or some people might call it electricity. What we're doing is we're just moving that energy. We, in our body, we have what we call meridians or pathways and the chakras are very important to energy practice because the chakras are energy centers that are physical places of the nerve ganglia where they conglomerate on your spine, moving down your nervous system. So your chakras are aligned with your nervous system. So if you want to look at it from a physical perspective, what we're doing is we're relaxing the tension and the stress in the nervous system by unwinding or unlocking the places in the nervous system where they're stuck. And in that way, we're moving energy and we're unblocking or unsticking and creating flow. And um, that's kind of the scientific way that you might approach it, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it absolutely. Does. Sense. It's really, really, really great. It's like things that from our fascia podcast, we talked about fascia and in this explanation is wonderful because you can see how you can go for this flow in the body from many different modalities. Mm-hmm. And I think this is kind of mine and Amy's goal with in vibe life is to inform people of these modalities of healing. And what you're saying is just right in tune with what we've kind of been, what other people have been saying, you know, maybe using a different modality, but it's just, it's spot on with this flow and this energy in the body and this healing and how many pieces of the puzzle really all affect each other, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and then not one is the answer to everything that, you know, when you bring them together, there's more power in that. Mm-hmm. Or, or that a physical symptom may be a manifestation 
of an emotional or energetic essential blockage. And, you know, we, we just talked about that last week too, Cheryl, in our podcast, yeah. body awareness and, and pain in the body. But this is where all of these things start to intersect. So that kind of leads me to, since we're doing, you know, this is a one-on-one introduction for our audience, who would be a good candidate? Like, who is a good person out there now? What might someone be experiencing where maybe go ahead and think about Reiki or, you know, give it a try? I'm going to say that everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Reiki. Um, just any, everybody can benefit from this practice, but people who are typically seeking Reiki as a treatment practice are, um, dealing with PTSD, um, and trauma and, and, you know, whether or not they're diagnosed with PTSD or not, anxiety, depression, sleeping troubles, um, autoimmunity and chronic illness where traditional methods are not working for them. Uh, those are typically the people that I'm seeing that are searching for Reiki. I mean, that was my, uh, my own experience. I was looking for something because I wasn't able to get help through traditional medicine. And those are the kinds of folks that typically are coming in for treatment. But They're I'm, also the people, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I, I've heard more and more, even some hospitals or acute care centers are starting to bring in Reiki practitioners to go uh, hand and with Western medicine, from what I understand. Right, because we're able to show now places you might want to look into uh, Raven Keys and the Raven Keys Medical Reiki International. It's another form of, um, it's not a different form of Reiki, but they are training Reiki masters to provide Reiki in hospitals and institutions. Uh, Raven Keys actually um, got famous, well, not just famous, but she got well known because Dr. Oz brought her into the operating room. Oh, Oh, Uh, wow. Yeah. And, but, you know, that's important because through her work with Dr. Oz and Dr. Feldman in New York, we're able to show or like show the benefits of Reiki physically. Folks who are receiving Reiki while they're having a surgical procedure done um, are staying calmer and more comfortable. The surgery usually um, goes quicker. The recovery time is faster we're able to show that folks who are doing, um, they also uh, use it a lot in breast cancer patients. We're able to show that folks who are receiving chemotherapy actually handle it better when they're receiving regular Reiki treatments. Um, Folks who are taking medications are able to um, mitigate the side effects because they're receiving regular Reiki treatments. Um, In my own practice, because I'm dealing mostly, like I specialize in working with the energy of trauma, I can show, I can get folks from a place where their fight or flight response is completely activated to a place where they can experience long periods or even short periods of calm and rest. And when you can get the body to calm and rest, you can reset the nervous system to a point where people are not reacting to everything that activates them or reminds them of the trauma that they've been experiencing. We like to use the word trigger. It's a hot word. I prefer the word activate, but that's what I mean. And so you can get folks to the point where they're not constantly living in a state of activation. And we can show that we can demonstrate those results. Now. I heard one lecturer actually say that most pain or chronic pain is actually the manifestation of the memory of a past trauma or event. So, I mean, he calls it holographic. Yeah. Yeah. And somatic therapy talks about that a lot. It's a different modality, but those two go together really well. And so it is holotropic breathwork and EMDR. All of these practices kind of uh, benefit each other and complement each other. But, uh, you know, it's not always the case. Sometimes chronic pain is just chronic pain. And, but we can also show that physical ailments or physical pain in the body actually are places where emotion and is emotion is broken from trauma and the energy of that is stuck. And that's how energy work can help by gently, softly going in and working it out instead of this whole go fast, force your memories, get it out now. It's soft, gentle, slow paced relaxation 
and release that helps folks get through those places. So I'm just going to throw a few things at you. Okay. And I I mean, I have a feeling it's going to be yes, 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 yes. But, (laughs) uh, you know, obviously a major, you've just been diagnosed with a major illness. That would be a good time to maybe consider Reiki. And, you know, again, we're not saying it needs to be instead of Western medicine, but in addition to, in addition to, yes. Right. Or, right. or, you know, what Cheryl and I say all the time on things like this is why not try it? Right. You know, you, it can't really hurt you. Right. Why, why not see if it can help you, you know, putting a chemical in your body may or may not hurt you. And we do that pretty willingly. So I always think when it's an alternative therapy, why not try it? You know, maybe it'll help. Okay. So you've just been diagnosed with an acute illness. Um, you know, maybe you have chronic migraines. That would be a person mm-hmm. who might benefit from Reiki mm-hmm. or um, you find yourself with hormonal changes. Is that something that can be addressed or yeah. helped? Yes, actually a lot because I mean, if you think about your energy centers and you know, I don't have time to go into chakras because uh-huh. There are better people than I have spent a lot of time on that. But thinking about, like, let's just talk about um, a person, a, a, a woman who identifies as a woman who has female organs. That is going to be happening in their sacral chakra. So there's also the energy of what the sacral chakra governs, which is personal expression and passion and creativity. And so we can work with the energy of what happens in that part of the body to help release what's stored and stuck. Oftentimes, hormonal imbalance from an energetic perspective is stuck energy in the sacrum. Hmm. No matter <laughs> what gender you identify as. Let me take my right. note. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, for That's myself. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and what if um, more emotional side, depression, you already mentioned anxiety, um, nervousness, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mean, well, one thing I guess I want to say is to kind of come back to something you were saying in the beginning of that question. Reiki is not a substitute for medical care. Right. I would never ever say that or recommend that to anybody. Some of these things like anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, things like schizophrenia, disassociative disorder, those are neurological addiction, substance use. Those are neurological, verified neurological issues. I hate the word disorder, but they're, they're verified neurological things that we have to deal with. There are people who are being medicated for that. Um, and within reason don't, I would never suggest to stop that or change that. That's not what Reiki is here to do. Yeah. I think that you can do your own healing to get to the point to take less medication, to live a healthier lifestyle, but I would never suggest taking you off something that is keeping you going because your body isn't making the chemical. You need help to make that chemical. Right. He's not going to make that chemical. And I want to put that same caveat out there too. Yeah. That's not what I was suggesting either. I think my suggestion is the things we're just so willing to try yeah. versus the things we're so scared to try always surprise me. Like, you know, if a doctor tells me here, take this, I'm uh, okay. I, I get it filled and I take it. But hearing, well, this energy work might give you some relief in this area too. So many of us are think, oh, that is just so far out there. I wouldn't dare try it. Mm -hmm. Or what I've come to realize over the last 10 years with, you know, having gone through some medical issues of my own is why not? Well, you know, well, I'll I'll try it all. But, you know, if it it can't harm me, bring it on. Let's see what might help or at least bring me some relief. Maybe in the case of medication, it'll even make it work more effectively. Or like you said, take the side effects out. Right. But but, so definitely physical conditions might receive some help. Trauma might receive some help, but also emotional. Mm -hmm. Right. From a physical place, emotions from a physical place, because emotions, when they're out of balance, typically we're looking at the nervous system. Your Mm -hmm. nervous system is holding that in your body. So if you can... Your vagus nerve starts back here and your vagus nerve is what's responsible for regulating your fight, flight, freeze responses in various forms. With Reiki, if you can work to calm the energy of the vagus nerve, you can calm the vagus nerve around the heart and in the gut and it will help take away the tension from those emotions. That makes so much sense. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. 
Yeah. Coming to Reiki and children. So does a session with a child look different than it would doing a session with an adult? In my experience, it does. You would think that they would just be the same, but I find that the smaller the body, the faster the Reiki. Um, yeah. I didn't, you know, I, I I didn't think that that was the case until I, until I started doing more Reiki on children. But I have worked with small children, um, and I've worked with children of all ages. And the smaller child, it, the faster it goes. But it does look different in that the child itself, like we can't expect a five year old to lay on the table and lie still. So what I'll usually do is I'll have a parent come in and maybe keep them busy with um, coloring or holding hands. And sometimes they're really fascinated by the crystals or the things that are in the room. And as long as I can keep them like active, but in one place, it's a lot easier to do. But sometimes I've had small children sit down in my room and start to feel the Reiki and say, no, I'm like, okay, we're not going to do it because they are feeling something and that's not something that they know how to explain or define. So okay, then we'll stop. Um, but the Reiki moves through the body the same way, other than that whole experience that I've had with the smaller, the body, the faster, the Reiki. Healing. Why do you think that a child or even maybe an adult might have that same reaction of no, I don't, you know, does it scare them? Does it, why would they, why do you think they would have that reaction to it? Um, there's a consent thing. I think with children, like we can ask them, Hey, can I hold your hand? You may feel some of tingling or tickling or, um, fuzziness. And even if they say yes, they're still not old enough to understand what that means. And so they need yeah. to be able to say like, that makes me uncomfortable. No. Yeah. Um, it's something that they don't fully understand. Like I, again, I've had small children be totally all about it. And then I've had other small children say, Whoa, no. Yeah, that doesn't feel good. And the same yeah. thing happens with animals and pets. Like, you yeah. know, you'll go to give Reiki to a pet and they'll get up and walk away. There's something about that they're not ready for, they don't want, and they, you know, they don't have to. And I don't necessarily know why other than they, can, they want to stay, they want to be able to say no. Like I, that yeah. feels uncomfortable to me. Yeah. Well, I think it's also that, you know, like in everything, it's a personal decision. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we all have to come to our healing on our own ultimately. And if you're not ready to accept it, you're not ready to accept it. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, honor that process as well, I think, and trust that you'll be ready when the time is right. Yeah. And children just have less to work with to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. They have less life experience to work with, to be able to say, Hey, I do want this, or I don't want this. Yeah. Yeah. So if I was to sign up and do Reiki with you, would it typically be an hour session? Is the first session longer? Is it, you know, how does that work? So I would say that that varies depending on the practitioner. Different practitioners have different styles, which kind of makes me want to go in two different directions with this. Um, just my little tangent. People, when they are tuned to Reiki, are they receive this gift of how they give Reiki and experience Reiki differently. And I think that's based on their individual gifts as healers and folks and, and people. So everybody does it different, which is another reason why we have a hard time defining what Reiki is. Okay. Um, for me, I kind of have a structured process. This is where that scientific background comes in, where the session is set up, you know, we come in, we talk, we set an intention, we do Reiki for 30 to 40 minutes, and we discuss again. And so usually the session is between an hour to an hour and a half, sometimes a little longer. When I'm working with trauma, sessions are longer, but then again, I'm adding other tools, not just Reiki to those. So there's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. But, and I like to, I kind of have a treatment plan set up, especially if I'm working with somebody who's activated in their trauma or somebody who's dealing with like recently being diagnosed with an illness. I like to set up, um, hour to hour and a half sessions every other week for three to four months. That's about 10 sessions. And that way I can start them with, let's just, let's get you calm first and then let's start getting deeper and working through the deeper things and maybe getting into deeper practices. And you can usually see a shift or a change and decide where you're going after about three months of treatment. As a patient or a client, would I need to do anything other than see you those times? Or if I just come in and see you and then go about my normal day, will I get the benefit? 
I prefer to give you tools you can take with you, meditation practices and maybe some mindfulness practices or some affirmation, not affirmations, but reframing practices. Um, I think it's more beneficial to the person if they are also working on themselves or doing their own work in their lifestyle. Um, I don't, there's no requirement, whatever makes you feel comfortable, do what works for you. But I do find that people have better responses and their healing process is um, easier when they are doing, when they are taking care of themselves and taking suggestion outside of the sessions. And that's an important thing to know about Reiki as well. Reiki isn't some magic pill. It's not like I'm going to, it's not like you're going to walk in and I'm going to give you Reiki and you're going to be healed forever. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes <laughs> it's a very real thing, but it's not the norm. Like I'm going to give you Reiki as part of your treatment. And hopefully you're also, um, depending, like if I'm dealing with trauma and emotional issues, hopefully you're also talking to a therapist, doing some type of somatic therapy or talk therapy. Um, and you've got some sort of daily routine or process, even if it's just something small, like how you drink your coffee in the morning, but you're doing something on your own. And I'm giving you Reiki to help supplement that change. So I think it works better if they're doing stuff in between. And is they know that it's not, it's not some, I'm just going to, I'm going to touch you and everything is going to go away. Right. 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 Yeah. I think that's probably one of the biggest education um, obstacles with clients, patients, you know, letting them know that this process of growth and healing is a process, right? And it, there's no magic pill and um, life is work. And I don't mean work in a bad way. It's just, it's like putting gas in your car and you know, making sure the oil gets changed, you know, that's kind of how our bodies, our emotions and our life really works. It's this is a process. And um, I love what you're saying about Reiki because I feel like it's going to uh, reach people that are looking for something to help them maybe get over the hump. How you were saying you, you had Hashimoto's and doctors were looking at you saying, oh, they might even been saying you're crazy. You're too young. You couldn't have all that going. And when people aren't listening, it's really important to have these choices that, you know, of Reiki and other modalities that really, like Amy said, you know, they're not going to hurt. So why not? And I feel like there's so many people out there looking for things to try that are going to fix them. Not fix, maybe that's not the best word, but you know, guide them on this journey of getting better. And, you know, Reiki seems like a really great choice for that. Something that um, works on a cellular level without us even realizing it's working at a cellular level. Yeah. I would say, yes, the benefits will last for several days or the treatment lasts for several days after they walk out of your office. Right. right. Now, okay. right, so here's the bigger question for this moment, because everyone can see we're all on split screen. We're still in the middle of COVID and we're going to share all of Izzy's information, her website and everything in the show notes to this. Are you able to do sessions remotely? Yes. And it's one of the very amazing and beautiful things about Reiki. Um, you're so uh, in our training, we learn how to do something called distance healing. And it's based on the idea, again, that we're becoming the energy of oneness. So because of this principle of connecting to the energy of oneness, I'm able to connect to energy wherever I put my intention into connecting to it. So yes, I am doing remote healing and I am able to connect to folks' energy and give them Reiki over distance. And it works the same. You know, there's a little bit of a different flavor, like, uh, my sessions aren't as long. Like I'm not sitting in that state for 45 minutes, more like 30 minutes, but I'm still able to do it. The release is still happening. The meditative part is still happening. The calm is still happening. Yeah. It's a, it's a really amazing thing actually. Well, and then the further cool thing about that, besides that people from anywhere who might be watching this or listening to this could contact you if they feel a connection Mm -hmm. is that when like you talked about 
um, Dr. Oz bringing a practitioner into the operating room. Mm -hmm. If someone is, let's say, preparing for a surgery or a major event like that, and they meet with you, then you could be working on them remotely while they're Mm -hmm. receiving that chemo or in that surgery or maybe on that flight that they have severe phobia about or whatever, you know, it is that might be happening, which is yep. a really beautiful way to extend um, the benefits and the power of it. And that's really the amazing thing. I, I have done Reiki for folks remotely and um, in person in medical situations and institution situations, such as like recovery um, treatment uh, facilities. But the thing about Reiki is you can be channeling Reiki for anything. You can channel Reiki to bring life back to the land that you live on, to bring that same balance to the land. You can channel it for your pets. Mostly you're so you need to be channeling it for yourself, but you can channel it um, into your food to make your food more balanced and healthy. Wow. You can literally channel Reiki for any reason, for anything, anytime. Um, and that's the amazing part about it. Like there's no limitation to when you can be using Reiki or what you can be using it for. That's pretty amazing. I love the little food comment because now I can channel it right into my wine and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how it works for wine. From a scientific perspective, the molecules in wine are technically a poison to your body. Oh, so I don't, come know. On, don't crush me. <laughs> <laughs> sorry but you know you sure could do it in that chocolate right yeah. <laughs> maybe if I do more chocolate than wine it might counterbalance it <laughs> I think my minor in chemistry ruined me when it comes to understanding how alcohol works in the body oh man <laughs> well this has been great Izzy it's so informative um I think it'll really help the audience out there understand more of what's going on as far as the audience of themselves. But also I love that we got to address kids and um, doing it remotely. I have one more quick question. Sure. So what if I wanted you to send Reiki to somebody else? Is that work without them knowing it? Like, because there might, no, it doesn't work. Okay, just kidding. Um, for, it, it works. Like, the practice works, but there's consent. Okay, we need, okay. We need consent. Like, and yeah, technically you can do it, but I uh, I wouldn't do anything for anyone ever without their permission. Yes, got it, got it. That makes complete sense. But I was just, you know, thinking, ooh, you know, someone this would be great for. I wonder if you could send it to them, you know? <laughs> I wish, I mean, I wish we could, but they have to, like Amy was that saying earlier, they really have to come to it in their own time and they have to right. want it and they need yes. to be able to say yes or no to that. That's an important part of a person's sovereignty. And yeah. Time. It's a part of their healing too, you know, that they're ready for it. So that's a I good love question. That. I'm glad you asked. Well, it's, it's good to know. I just thought I'd be curious that your answer makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I think that we've kind of given people a really good overview of what Reiki is and what it can do for them and who the right person, uh, you know, you know, what questions someone would ask and what they need to find out more about Reiki. And if anybody Um, has any other questions and they direct them to me and Cheryl, we will forward them on and get them answered, um, forward them to Izzy or anything like that. We just want people to feel comfortable learning more about it, exploring it, considering it. Yeah. And I want people to also know that I think Reiki, and you can clarify this more a little bit, Izzy, but Reiki is just a small piece of what you do. And so we look forward to having you back again and again and again to tell us about other modalities and deeper learnings and so that we can really dive into all of the healing practices that you offer. Yeah, and Reiki, again, is just one tool that I'm using in my practice with my clients and with my students. Um, My work is primarily focused on trauma-informed care and the energy of trauma and uh, soul retrieval and healing soul wounds, uh, which gets into a whole nother That's another podcast, but it's going to be great. (laughs) Many things, yeah. Um, So Reiki is part of what I do. Not So a thing that's important to know is that 
you can just come to me for Reiki. You don't have to come to me for trauma work. It's not something, even if you did come to me for trauma work, it would not be the first thing that we do. We would first start with Reiki because it takes, in my humble thought process, it takes time to work into healing trauma and we need to be able to feel safe and trust each other first. Reiki helps us do that. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. I love it. I think it's great. And we'll go ahead and put all your contact information out there so people can reach out to you because you have been a fountain of knowledge for both Amy and I and everyone that's listening. And thank you very much. It's been awesome having you here. So much fun to have you. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for listening to the In Vibe Life podcast. For more information and to join our community, be sure and check out our website at www.invibelife.com. We look forward to sharing with you.